Hello everyone, Mr. Waz here, and welcome to another episode of Wazly Science. In this episode, we are going to talk about historical geology. Okay. Um, I actually don't know a lot about historical geology. Do you need some help? Oh man, yes! Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Summa Science. Today we'll be covering historical geology. So these are the NGSS DCIs, uh, which cover earth materials and systems uh, for the high school earth science standards. In this video, we will be covering the following five topics, the formation of earth and moon, earth's interior, the geologic time scale, mass extinctions, and feedback loops. The formation of the earth and moon. The Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago from the remaining material in the solar system after the formation of our Sun. The early Earth was not a pleasant place to be. It was very hot, molten rock for most of its early life. And then approximately 4 billion years ago, during what's known in our solar system as the late heavy bombardment period, a protoplanet named Thea collided with early Earth. This theory of the Moon's formation is called the Giant Impact Theory and plays an important role in the materials found on our planet today. As you can see in the animation to the right, there's different colored material. There's the blue material made up of more dense material, and then the yellow and red material of less dense material. The blue material is more dense, therefore it sinks towards the middle, and the yellow and red material stay along the outside perimeter of Earth, as well as in space, which would eventually condense to form our moon several million years later. These materials left over from the collision eventually begin to cool and order themselves based upon their density. Again, the highest density material gravitates towards the center of what would become Earth's core, and the less dense material is closer to the surface. The material still in orbit eventually condenses to form the moon that we have today. Let's take a closer look at the diagram from the previous slide. As you can see, scientists have organized the Earth's layers based upon two principles. The first, what it is made out of, and secondly, how it behaves. On the left side, there are the important physical layers of the Earth, otherwise known as how they interact with one another. Uh, the two most important parts of this side of the diagram are the lithosphere, which is the Earth's crust and the uppermost mantle, and the asthenosphere, which is the outer mantle responsible for plate tectonics. The hard and brittle lithosphere essentially rides atop the softer, more easily deformed asthenosphere. Also on this diagram is the mesosphere, which is part of the mantle, and an outer and inner core. The outer core is believed to be liquid iron-nickel, inside of which our solid, mostly iron core, rotates. On the right side of this diagram, there are the chemical layers of the Earth. Scientists have organized these layers based upon the chemical makeup or ingredients of the layers of the Earth. There is the crust, the mantle, and the core. This grouping method into two separate categories could be a little bit confusing, but it's certainly worthwhile to understand. Uh, as usual, an analogy. Think of a poodle and a pit bull. They are both dogs at a chemical or genetic level, However, you may choose to group them differently based upon their appearance and behavior, just like you would the layers of the Earth. Here's another diagram of Earth's interior. Remember that the density decreases as you move further away from Earth's core, as does the temperature coming from that core. Uh, the semicircle down to the left is drawn to scale. As you can see, the crust is barely noticeable. It's very thin compared to the rest of the Earth. Um, taking a look at the blown up pie slice, uh, it is not to scale, but it does give you some recordings as to the thickness and depth of the different layers of Earth. The terms on this slide are very important to understand, not simply just to memorize the words that are on the slide, but to be able to apply them in an intelligent manner to answer questions or talk about the Earth's interior please take a moment to pause the video and write these terms down into your notebook. So you might be asking yourself, how do we know what these layers of the earth are made out of? 
Uh, well, there are a variety of methods that scientists have used over the years to determine the makeup of our planet. Uh, for rock layers closer to the surface, GPR, or ground penetrating radar, is used. This allows scientists to notice changes in the rock layers without needing to expose the layer itself. And from there, they could draw conclusions based upon what they know of the region, along with other data and observations as to what the rock looks like immediately beneath the surface. This lawnmower looking device is rather easy to use. However, it is limited to the topmost layers of the Earth's surface. Certainly, it does not penetrate deep enough uh, to study the interior layers of the Earth. To determine the different components of Earth's deep interior, a different, more complex method is needed. They dug a hole to China. I'm kidding. You can't really do that. Anyway, they actually study waves. Not water, light, or sound waves, but earthquake waves, more scientifically referred to as seismic waves. They record these waves using a device known as a seismograph, seen down below. By studying the seismograms, which is the finished report from a seismograph, scientists can determine what sort of material the wave passed through based upon its speed. By using the location of the earthquake's epicenter and studying seismograms from the same quake throughout different parts of the world, scientists were able to develop their understanding of the Earth's interior. We will get more in depth about earthquakes and their waves in a later unit, but as you can see, different types of waves travel at different speeds through different sorts of material. Um, there are what are called P waves and S waves. Um, some of these waves are able to travel through liquid material, while others are not, which allowed us to determine that there is a very liquid portion of the outer core. Now let's move on into geologic time and the geologic time scale. Uh, think about if you were asked what a long time is. Your definition depends on what it is you're talking about. An hour is a long time to wait for a table at a restaurant. Two weeks is a long time to go without seeing a parent or a family member. And 20 years is a long time for a cat to live. However, as humans, we are sort of limited to our understanding of time. The average life expectancy is around 74 years for a human, slightly more if you're a female. So to us, 100 years is a very long time. However, when we speak about the history of Earth and other extremely large quantities of time and space, it gets a bit harder to comprehend just how vast time really is. Because of this, scientists have created what is known as the geologic time scale, pictured over to the right. Over the years, this scale has been reordered and relabeled based upon new evidence in the rock record. But overall, it is a very well-organized system that is used to understand the evolution of our planet and the life that lives on it. Generally speaking, the time scale separates different periods of time based upon major changes in the presence or disappearance of life on the planet, major changes in the life that dominated the planet, and global environmental shifts. The geologic time scale itself can be a bit overwhelming and certainly confusing, so let's take a quick moment to take a look at how it's organized. Um, the largest unit of time on the geologic time scale are what are called eras, followed by periods, or systems, and then finally epochs, which are generally the smallest units of geologic time. Uh, remember that this isn't simply as easy as saying that a decade is 10 years long or a century is 100. Uh, the major eras that we will examine in this slideshow are the Precambrian era, which consists of three eras, but we will group them together for our understanding of this, followed by the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and our present Cenozoic era. So let's begin at the beginning. The Precambrian era basically started with the formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago, and continued for most of Earth's history up until about 540 million years ago. 
There was little to no life present on Earth through most of the Precambrian. Conditions on Earth ranged from a molten rock to a water-covered planet to an entirely ice-covered planet. Needless to say, life on Earth was tough during this period. So Precambrian literally translates to before life, and while this is true, for the most part, there certainly was life present on Earth at this moment. However, it wasn't very advanced, it certainly wasn't abundant, and it really never left the oceans. In the middle of the Precambrian era, about 2.4 billion years ago, a major event happened which changed the shape of our planet forever. This is what's known as the Great Oxygenation Event. Um, basically, simple photosynthesizing plants in the ocean were converting carbon dioxide present in the air into usable oxygen. Over the course of the next several billion years, this oxygen allowed for life to flourish. The reason for this was twofold. First, animals that use oxygen for life could now more easily do so and begin to thrive in the right conditions. And secondly, by removing the excess carbon from the atmosphere and trapping it in the oceans, the planet's temperature began to cool off and stabilize for a long time. It was much cooler than it had been in the past. At the end of the Precambrian era begins the Paleozoic era and what's known as the Cambrian Explosion or the Explosion of Life on Earth. During this period, many firsts were seen, including uh, the first shells, ferns, sharks, terrestrial plants, reptiles, and more. Earth at this time was also very tectonically active. The continents were beginning to take shape and move about the globe in a variety of different forms. There was a breakup of a major supercontinent at the beginning of this era and the formation of Pangaea at the end. Also during this period, most of the fossil fuels that we use today were formed and buried. Three of the five mass extinctions recognized by scientists occurred during different periods of the Paleozoic era. While life flourished at this time, the Earth was going through a long and painful road of finding a balance of temperature, tectonics, atmosphere. Earth was a very moody planet that would occasionally have tantrums in the forms of mass glaciations, volcanic events, and earthquakes. Many say the Earth was in its adolescent phase at this time and began to stabilize a bit more after the Paleozoic. The Paleozoic officially ended with what is known as the Permian extinction, which saw roughly 90% of all life on Earth become extinct. This massive extinction event leading into the Mesozoic era allowed for new and exciting life to thrive and evolve rapidly in the absence of many predators. Life was extremely diverse during this era, and it has three very distinct periods the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. During this period, we also saw Pangaea split apart and begin to form our present-day continents. The southernmost portion of Pangaea contained the continent Gondwana. Uh, Gondwana consisted of present-day Australia, South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and New Zealand. This portion of Pangaea is some of the best evidence we have for plate tectonics as well as the fossil record. The Mesozoic is probably best known because this is the era in which dinosaurs existed. They were alive for about 185 million years, which is much, much longer than they've been extinct. This is probably the best understood era of geologic time. Uh, simply because the rock record is at just the right age to allow scientists to rather easily study these creatures and the atmosphere that existed during this time period. Uh, it has also been the topic of the Hollywood franchise Jurassic Park since 1994, although it should more appropriately be labeled Mesozoic Park, as many of the creatures shown in these movies never actually existed during the same time period. The Mesozoic era ended with the most recent mass extinction, known as the KT extinction. We'll dive into this quite a bit more in a little while.
after the KT extinction, our current geologic era known as the Cenozoic officially begins. Uh, the first human species have been found as long ago as several million years, and evidence exists of as many as nine different species of humans roaming the planet at the same time. Modern humans, Homo sapiens, didn't appear until about 300,000 years ago as they evolved in Africa. The continents of Earth look very similar to how they appear today. Again, remember, 65 million years isn't that long relative to the rest of Earth's history. This era is marked by the evolution of mammalian life on land. So we are still living in the Cenozoic era. More specifically, we are living in the Epoch, which again is the second smallest unit of geologic time, called the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene recognizes the huge impact that humans have had on the Earth system, specifically on the atmosphere, the biology, geology, and hydrology of our planet. We will spend much more time later on in the year investigating the human impact on our planet. In addition to us making our undeniable mark on the planet, there is strong evidence suggesting that a sixth mass extinction may already be underway, influenced by us humans. What is considered a mass extinction? In order to qualify as a mass extinction, the following criteria need to be met. First off, the event needs to be global or nearly global in scale, meaning that it's not isolated to, let's say, the Pacific coast or the inner regions of a particular continent. Secondly, a large number of species need to go extinct not simply the passenger pigeon or the trilobites. Third, a large variety of species go extinct, meaning this isn't simply land plants or marine life, but rather all life is affected by this event. And last, the species extinctions need to occur in a short span of time, geologically speaking that is. There's evidence of some of our mass extinctions taking as long as 20 million years. What are the five mass extinctions? In order from the oldest to the most recent, we'll go through these and discuss them quickly. The Ordovician Silurian extinction occurred a little over 400 million years ago. Uh, this extinction occurred in two major phases. The first one saw most floating and swimming life go extinct, followed several million years later by bottom-dwelling marine animals and bacteria. The causation of this is thought to be a cooling of the planet associated with the formation of polar ice caps. Keep in mind that ice is extremely reflective, so sunlight wasn't absorbed as easily on the planet, creating what's known as a feedback loop. We'll discuss this more later, but these play an important role in almost all of the extinctions. Following the Silurian extinction, life exploded on Earth during the Devonian, primarily in the oceans. The Devonian extinction occurred next, where most of the marine life on the planet went extinct. The life that developed at this point was best suited for the warmer climate of the times, once Earth's temperature had stabilized. However, many of the species of the planet still resided in the oceans, as animals had yet to really begin to dominate the land. However, plants were very dominant on land, more specifically forests. This may have increased the rate at which weathering and erosion occurs, and the surface water runoff into the ocean may have created a process known as eutrophication. We'll learn a lot more about this later on in the year, but essentially, this process removes the oxygen from the water, which, as you can imagine, doesn't bode too well for the animals that need that oxygen. This is thought to be one of the reasons for this extinction. However, another reason would be the reformation of ice caps and a dramatic decrease of temperature on the planet. This would disrupt the food chain and ocean currents, there is evidence that Earth's surface temperature dropped from greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit down to about 78 degrees during this extinction event. 
the next extinction that we'll take a look at is known as the Great Dying. Roughly 90% of all marine life and 70% of land species died off during this time period. Um, at this point in geologic history, Pangaea was fully formed. Due to this giant landmass in the middle of the oceans, climate patterns were greatly disrupted, ocean circulation was limited, and the interior of the supercontinent Pangaea was extremely vulnerable to changes in temperature and precipitation depending on the latitude. As Pangaea began to split up, an excessive amount of volcanoes flooded the atmosphere with carbon dioxide and ash, resulting in severe disturbances in the amount of sunlight available to plants on the surface, and eventually a positive feedback loop, more specifically known as a greenhouse effect, occurred. The excess carbon dioxide in this atmosphere increased the planet's temperature significantly. This is thought to be the main reason behind this extinction. However, one thing is for certain, in order for this extinction event to have occurred at the scale at which it did, the events leading into this extinction must have been long-lasting and severe. Not too long after the Permian extinction came the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. This extinction is thought to have been caused by an extreme amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere released as Pangaea continued to split apart. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere again increased the temperature of the Earth's surface and set about a chain of events which created this extinction. The last and most recent extinction event we'll take a look at is known as the KT extinction. This occurred roughly 65 million years ago and is best known for the end of the age of the dinosaurs. We have the most evidence as to why this extinction event occurred and we'll dive into that a little bit more later on in this lecture. How do we know about these extinction events and how did we find out about them? Well, there is something called index fossils. These are fossils that are found in particular rock layers of a certain time over a wide area. They will disappear at roughly the same time at a global scale in the fossil record. These are crucial for dating rocks. Over to the right, you'll see a variety of different trilobites, which are one of the most famous index fossils they are used primarily because of their hard outer shell and they're easily preserved in sediment. The next way that we found out about these extinctions is looking at the presence of fossils or lack of presence of fossils in the rock record. As you can see on the right hand side, the bottom layers below the red line consist of a variety of different fossil types. And then after this red line, the types and variety of life seem to go down. This is a good example of how scientists look at different layers of rock and examine the presence and disappearance of different types of life. Basically what I'm trying to say is geologists and paleontologists are rock detectives. Not quite like this guy. How do we know what caused these extinctions? As discussed earlier, it's hard to tell why the species died off sometimes, but here are some ways that scientists try to piece together Earth's past. They take a look at sediment cores. Looking at sedimentary rock and examining the presence of certain chemical markers that would determine dramatic shifts in temperature, atmospheric composition, or the presence of fresh and salt water allows scientists to determine if a major shift in the climate of Earth were to cause an extinction event. Another way that scientists determine the causation of extinctions is to take a look at impact craters from asteroids or meteors. Weathering and erosion could quickly erase evidence of these craters on Earth's surface because of our active atmosphere that has wind blowing across the surface, water constantly falling on it, and flooding events which could get rid of this evidence through weathering and erosion. Lastly is tectonic activity. By looking at how active the tectonic plates were on Earth, scientists would be able to determine the location of certain pieces of land at a given point in geologic history, which could help them determine the presence of ice caps, what latitude 
the region of that continent existed at during a particular time period, which as you could imagine, dictates the temperature and amount of precipitation received at that region at a particular point in Earth's past. Do we really know what caused all of these extinctions? Well, because of their age, they're a little bit hard to put a cause to for certain. The reasoning behind each is debatable and up for editing in the presence of new or better evidence, which, by the way, is one of the best parts of science. Our understanding of these extinctions is based upon our understanding of current science, and as we work to piece together the causation of these previous extinctions, one thing is for certain that one event leads into another, and all of them are kind of related. The big takeaway from all of these extinction events is that the Earth is a complex system dependent upon other aspects in that system to maintain a balance. When something happens, such as a lot of tectonic activity or an asteroid impact, that balance is disrupted and it takes the Earth a lot of time to get back to a balance, which unfortunately isn't always a good thing for the life that exists on the planet. The KT extinction, however, is one for which we have plenty of evidence. What is that evidence? Well, first off, there is a large crater on the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico called the Chicxulub Crater. It's about 112 miles wide, and it's dated in the rock record to about 65 million years ago. A second piece of evidence for the KT extinction is a thin layer of siltstone, which has the element iridium present in it, which is very rarely found on Earth, but is super common in space objects. This layer of iridium is found in the rock record at about the same time all throughout the globe. The picture to the right was taken at the Natural History Museum in San Diego by me this summer, this layer was pulled from a rock outcrop in Southern California. The last piece of evidence for the KT extinction that we'll talk about are sediments deposited by a massive tsunami wave dating approximately 65 million years ago. As you can see, the evidence pieced together gives a pretty definitive idea as to what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, or what set about a series of events which led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. The two charts on this slide show the rise and fall of different types of life throughout geologic time. One of the big takeaways from studying these mass extinctions of our planet is to see that life which arose after each extinction event was better suited to survive the conditions of that time and all of those species kind of found their own niche in which to reside. Sometimes Earth's climate was better suited for marine animal life, such as the Devonian, and at other times, land plants fared better than animals. Life overall is persistent, resilient, and adaptable. Now on to the idea of feedback loops. So feedback loops are responsible for the Earth changing over time, as well as systems in the Earth staying the same over time. Uh, we'll take a quick look at negative feedback loops first. Throughout the year and continuing throughout the rest of the year, you'll hear us talk often about the idea of balance or equilibrium in nature. Negative feedback loops dampen or buffer changes in a system in order to kind of keep them in balance. Think of the relationship between plants and animals. As animals breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, plants take that carbon dioxide, create energy, and then release oxygen back into the atmosphere. These are changes which over enough time keep a balance in the relationship of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Another good example of this is the predator-prey relationship. So imagine in your neighborhood there is a sudden influx of mosquitoes. After a little while, the mosquitoes attract the attention of predators in the form of bats. These bats come into your neighborhood and eventually eat enough mosquitoes for the population to go down. 
However, due to the lack of mosquitoes, the bats may leave your neighborhood in the search for food. Over time, the mosquito population will rise once again because there aren't bats keeping them in check. Eventually, the bats may come back looking for food, further taking the population of the mosquitoes down, and this cycle may continue. While in the short term, there is a spike and a dip in the population of the mosquitoes and bats, over a long enough period of time, a balance is reached between the two. Now for positive feedback loops. These are anything but positive, unfortunately. They enhance or amplify changes in a system to further move it away from balance, making it more unstable. Uh, an example of this that we mentioned throughout the extinction slides were the formation or disappearance of ice caps. So let's take a quick look at the idea of the formation of ice caps. So ice, as you learned during Unit 2, is very reflective of sunlight. So the more ice there is, the less sunlight that is being absorbed. The less sunlight that's being absorbed, the cooler the temperature becomes. The cooler the temperature becomes, the more ice is formed. The more ice, the less light absorbed. And this continues on and on and on. These feedback loops often run away, such as the greenhouse effect. A runaway greenhouse effect occurs when a planet begins to warm and further changes increase the warming. So let's take a look at an example of this. This would be the disappearance of ice caps on a planet. So as the ice disappears, darker surface material is exposed, which absorbs more sunlight. As more sunlight is absorbed, the temperature increases. As the temperature increases, the ice caps melt faster. As they melt, more surface area is exposed. I think you guys understand the basic concept at this point, but if you are a bit unsure or you need some more examples of this, be sure to watch the video shown to the right as well as do some searches on your own. The idea of feedback loops, specifically positive feedback loops, are going to be present for the rest of this year. Let's take a look at how these positive feedback loops affect extinctions. Well, positive feedback loops can cause the Earth to change its climate dramatically over a relatively short period of time, which makes it incredibly difficult for many of the plants and animals currently living to adapt and survive. A change in important parts of life such as temperature, atmospheric composition, and the amount of fresh water available in a region have caused massive die-offs of life throughout Earth's history. Eventually, however, these positive feedback loops become interrupted. The amplification finds a limit and eventually something gives and the loop is broken. On the prior slide, we talked about the formation of ice caps and the growing amount of ice on the planet. Well, if this system were to get out of hand, meaning the ice formation were to continue, a situation known as snowball earth can occur. In at least one point in Earth's past, the entire planet was covered in snow and ice. Now, eventually, this feedback loop became broken. The weight of the ice and snow pushed down the Earth's crust enough to crack it, allowing volcanic eruptions to occur not just through the crust, but through the ice and snow as well. The ash from these volcanic eruptions eventually settled onto the surface of the ice and snow, making it slightly darker and therefore more able to absorb some of the incoming sunlight. Also, the carbon dioxide released during these volcanic eruptions began to trap heat in the atmosphere and allowed more ice to melt, lowering the albedo and melting more ice. Eventually, the Earth will reach equilibrium and a balance once again. And that's it for the first episode of Summa Science. Here are some video resources to give you a better understanding of geologic time and a deeper look into some of the mass extinctions that have occurred throughout Earth's history. There's also a pretty funny video on if Jurassic Park were to exist during different geologic eras. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in class. Thank you.